We eat a lot of bananas. It's the most popular fruit in the U.S., with nearly six and a half billion pounds consumed each year. But all those bananas are in big trouble. I had no idea that bananas were even under threat from a fungal disease. I'm Anissa Khalifa. This week on The Broadside, what a biotech company in North Carolina is doing to save the fruit from extinction. Okay, you're in the grocery store, the produce section, and you're running through your list. Let me get one orange. Actually, I need a lemon as well. I'll get it. You want to add some apples to the cart, but which kind? You want a Honeycrisp? Sure. Okay, great. And then, toward the back, you see a wave of yellow, or maybe green, the bananas. Oh, can you actually, can you grab two bunches of those? But unlike those apples, there's really only one kind of banana to choose from. Sure, you might spot some plantains nearby, but those bright yellow bananas found on the shelf and in your pantry, they're all the same variety. Any banana that you buy in a store, and I'm speaking specifically about the U.S. here, is something called the Cavendish banana. Andrew Zaleski is a contributing writer for Bloomberg Businessweek. He recently wrote a piece about the Cavendish banana, even though... Uh, I don't like bananas myself. Ooh, I also don't like bananas. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I eat apples and pears and blueberries, but not bananas. For the piece, Andrew looked into why the Cavendish is king in the banana industry and how an ominous fungus lurking within the soil is threatening its reign. The villain here is a fungus called Fusarium. Fusarium dwells in the soil and enters a banana plant through its roots, slowly invading the entire plant and eventually suffocating it. When it comes to the Cavendish banana, Fusarium wreaks utter and complete havoc and just murders the thing. For decades, Fusarium has trekked through banana fields across the world, from Southeast Asia to the Middle East and into Africa. In 2019, farmers and scientists spotted the banana-killing fungus in Colombia, a major producer of the global banana supply. Latin America is where the majority of Cavendish bananas for export are grown, and Cavendish bananas make up 99% of global banana exports. The specific strain of Fusarium that's wreaking havoc on the Cavendish is called Tropical Race 4, or TR4. The scary thing is, there's no remedy to naturally get rid of it. And then you don't have any bananas because the plant has been wiped out. Bananas. Great. We have wild bananas. There's actually fruit on them. Wow. So I mean, it smells like a flower nursery in here. It it's does. Kind of you a can smell bananas. Yeah. yeah. So this room contains a large number of. But of the Cavendish bananas. isn't going out without a fight. In Durham, North Carolina, a group of scientists are working to strengthen the plant against TR4. So I'm standing in an office park, <laughs> in the middle of RTP, surrounded by banana plants, which. It's wild to think that there's somewhere in North Carolina growing bananas because this is not the climate for it at all. That's correct. Recently, my colleague Bradley George visited Elo Life Systems, a biotech company focused on gene editing for crops. It's located in the Research Triangle Park here in North Carolina. Every cell in your body can have very small natural mutations. The same thing happens in plants. And so, for example, if you take lots of cuttings of plants in your garden, none of them are exactly the same. Bradley got a tour from the company's VP of Product Development, Matt DeLeo. They checked out Elo Life's greenhouse and the plants they hope will one day rescue the Cavendish. Many of these are naturally resistant to the TR4 fungus. They just don't have the, the fruit quality or the yield that's required to ship to a northern hemisphere market. Here's how it works. First, Elo Life studies lots of different types of bananas to see which ones are resistant to the TR4 strain. Yes, these bananas are all naturally resistant to TR4. So what we did is we went into their genomes, understood what was different about their genes that made them resistant. They selected about 100 targets. The banana itself, this is, this is a little wild. It has like more than 30,000 genes, which is more than a human has. And then they, they take that number, they narrowed it down to about 100, and then they test those. And then we took the Cavendish banana and only fixed those specific genes so that they would still have the fruit quality and yield while also now being resistant to TR4. If they are resistant, then it goes over to another lab where they actually create the bananas. They try to create these fusarium-resistant bananas. 
But that's one of the things that's devastating about this disease is that it's in the soil. So right. you can't spray a chemical to protect the plants. You can't remove it. It lives there for, for years and years and years. And so the only solution is to find bananas that are resistant to the disease genetically. It's a lot of work for one banana. But remember, the Cavendish is essentially a monoculture for the commercial banana industry. That means there's a single dominant variety in the entire world. So, what makes it so special for mass production? Why is it the only one we see on the shelf in grocery stores? The Cavendish banana, it, it's hardy. It travels well. It doesn't ripen too quickly. So by the time it reaches its destination, it's not gross. But Andrew Zaleski says relying on just one variety can be risky. If you have the same banana with the same genetic structure, the same genome, and you're planting hundreds of thousands of these bananas, and then some sort of disease comes in that attacks one of them, it's going to attack all of them. It's just going to get them all. There's no genetic diversity there to kind of offer some sort of layer of protection. You know, it's just game over. Walking through Elo's greenhouse, our man on the ground, Bradley George, wondered about the long-term viability of banana editing. So is there a risk then that at some point TR4 itself will change and then your variety of banana will become susceptible? Yes, that's absolutely a possibility and that's something that, that's common in, in agriculture, is that you have to keep finding new varieties to, to protect you from new pathogens. Elo Life's gene editing is a new approach to try and save this essential crop. It's a method scientists and farmers didn't have access to the first time the banana faced extinction. That's coming up after a short break. I'm Anita Rao, host of the weekly podcast Embodied. It's a show that no matter the topic dives into unexpected territory, like what it's like to first get an autism diagnosis as an adult, or how BDSM communities may change the way you think about kink. You'll meet folks who aren't afraid to question what we think we know about intimacy and who have some fascinating stories to share about their relationships. Listen to Embodied and let's take on the taboo together. Hey, this is Jared Walker. I'm an editor here at WUNC North Carolina Public Radio. Each week, I work with Anissa, Charlie, and the rest of the team here at The Broadside to bring you stories from this fascinating place we call home. But we can only do that with your support. So if you've enjoyed the reporting and original stories you've heard in the podcast, please donate by clicking the link in this week's episode description or go to wunc.org and click the donate button at the upper right-hand corner of the page. Thank you so much. Okay, now let's get back to the show. So Andrew, this isn't the first time the banana has been faced with total annihilation. When else did we see the rise and fall of a specific type of banana? The the backstory of bananas is, is interesting unto itself. There's a, a great writer... And I apologize, Dan, if you listen to this and I mispronounce your last name, Dan Koppel, Koppel, he wrote a great book called Banana, the Fate of the Fruit that Changed the World. And in that book, he talks about how the banana trade in the U.S. even started out. So it starts out this like seafaring captain coming back from Jamaica in 1870. He brings over all these bunches of banana called the Gro Michelle or Big Mike, basically. <laughs> and Gro Michelle was the banana in the U.S. And according to people who have tasted it before, it's sweeter, it's better. Someone had told me, one of the scientists that I interviewed the story actually told me, if you have like banana flavoring, it's Gros Michel flavoring. It's not Cavendish flavoring because the Gros Michel is sweeter. Huh. But anyway, this is the banana that uh, Standard Fruit, which is today Dole, and United Fruit, now Chiquita, were planting in Latin America, late 1800s, early 1900s. But the Gros Michel was susceptible to another fusarium strain known as Race 1 that jumped over the Pacific gets into the Latin American Gros Michel fields and starts wiping out those bananas. And by the 1960s, these companies have switched over completely to the Cavendish because the Cavendish is resistant to the race one strain. There was this other banana that everyone loved, gets killed by a fusarium strain. They switch over to the Cavendish and now, like a broken record, we're uh, sort of repeating the process. 
Okay, so we see the Gros Michel die out in the 1960s. Let's jump about 20 years later to the 1980s, back to Durham, North Carolina. That's when something pretty historic in food science happened in the same building where ELO Life is located, right? Yeah, so ELO's labs are actually located in the same building where Mary Dell Chilton did her work. And Chilton, in the early 80s, she created the first genetically modified crop. She inserted a yeast gene into a tobacco plant and then spent decades at a company called Syngenta. And, you know, Syngenta was the company that was first to commercialize BT corn that's been genetically modified to, to basically express this protein that will kill larvae of corn borers. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is kind of interesting how that is the place where Elo is doing this work and she's the leader in, in, in bioengineered crops. She's the person who did it first. Andrew, you and I both are not fans of bananas. I know there are plenty of people out there who do like them. But for the people who don't have bananas in their pantry, how does this story still affect them? More often than not, these sort of genetic modification approaches, they can be applied to other things. People get scared of hearing genetically modified in any context. All it means is you're manipulating a gene. You're trying to give some sort of resistance to a plant. No one's putting anything inside of you. You're not going to be sick from eating this banana. If you know how to do it in this one fruit, there's always the possibility that some fruit in the future that millions of people rely on becomes susceptible to some other bacteria. You know, the other thing is we sort of take Cavendish bananas for granted in the U.S. Down in South America, it is a subsistence food. People grow this also because they need food. If all of the Cavendish die... That's kind of a bigger problem than just, you know, being able to walk into your local Wegmans and go, oh, no bananas anymore. All right, I guess it's time to eat a pear. So it does matter. It matters outside of just the general context of people in America who like bananas and want to go get some on a Saturday morning, say. Don't despair. If you love bananas, if you are not like me and you like bananas, don't worry. They'll be around. There are lots of good work happening. Lots of smart scientists hacking the problem, so to speak. It's such an important part of people's lives. It's affordable. It's in, you know, every grocery store and convenience store you go to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there will be a time where they won't be there anymore if, you know, a group like ours isn't able to to create a resistant variety. Back at the greenhouse in Durham, ELO Life's Matt DeLeo told reporter Bradley George that these genetically modified banana plants aren't growing just in the labs anymore. We've been producing batches of of edited bananas uh, over time, and so the first batch is growing in field trials in Honduras, and they'll be harvested in late spring, early summer. Our partners at Dole will harvest the fruit and fully characterize its its qualities and yield uh, to see if it matches 100% what they need from the Cavendish, while also being resistant to the disease. So hopefully one of the bananas we showed you today will one day be the bananas that we all eat. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Like, someday I'll be in the supermarket, pick up a banana, I was like, wow, I saw... I saw one of your ancestors several years ago. This episode of The Broadside was produced by Charlie Shelton Ormond, who ate several bananas as he put it together. Special thanks to Bradley George for contributing to this episode. Our editor is Jared Walker, who is a big strawberry banana smoothie fan. Our executive producer is Wilson Sayre. The Broadside is a production of WUNC North Carolina Public Radio. You can email us at broadside at wunc.org. If you enjoyed the show, leave us a rating, a review, or share it with a friend. I'm Anissa Khalifa. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll be back next week. Next week.